Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second part of the Rare Breeding Birds Panel 50th Anniversary Conference. Uh, for those who attended yesterday, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, who am I? I'm Ian Francis. Uh, I'm a, a panel member, and I have been since 2001, and I live in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. For those of you who are new to RBBP, who didn't attend yesterday, just a reminder that we're the main system for recording breeding data and all the rare breeding birds in the UK, up to around 100 species or so every year. We report annually on numbers, trends and distribution, and we maintain a secure archive to support conservation and research for these species. We also collect data on the rare non-native breeding species. As yesterday, tonight we have a great lineup of speakers and you can find out more about them on the RBBP web website in the programme details. The talks are pre-recorded, but there will be live questions after each one. We won't monitor the chat that you can contribute to for questions in this conference. Please use the question and answer, the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll deal with the questions as they crop up. And please post questions as the talks go on. If they are covered in the talk, we can park them to one side, but um, we'd like questions to amass during the talk if possible. Um, let, just to let you know that we will be recording the meeting, um, and we're hoping to be able to put this onto YouTube. And to let you know that uh, everyone is muted and the videos are automatically turned off. Um, it's also worth emphasizing that if you ask questions, if you see a question that's been asked that you like, uh, you can use the, uh, the like button to upvote it, or if you like, push it up the queue so that we can see that more people wish to see that question answered. So without further ado, just to let you know that we're going to break at uh, five past eight and we're ending um, by 21.20, by uh, 20 past nine. So we'll move on to the talks and I'd like to give a quick introduction to Dawn, although she really needs very little introduction. Dawn's been chair of the Rare Breeding Panel since, nine, since 2020. She's worked for the BTO since 1992 on a wide range of census fieldwork and ringing projects. And she's currently head of surveys. Outside of work, She's a member of the British Birds Rarities Committee, a director of British Birds, and is on their editorial panel. And she's going to talk to us about what the RBBP data tells us. So over to you, Dawn. Hello, I'm Dawn Bulmer, Chair of the Rare Breeding Bird Panel and BTO representative on the panel. This evening, I'm going to start off by showing you some recent trends in species and then move on and tell you how rare breeding bird panel data are used. Like me, you probably vividly remember seeing your first little egrets in Britain. Mine was on the Hale Estuary in Cornwall in 1989, and I remember taking the train down from Plymouth where I was a student down to the Hale, and there it was on the estuary, amazing. Little did we know at the time how this species was going to expand and colonize as a breeding species. If we have a look at the graph here at the top, which shows the panel data, the blue line showing the maximum total pairs and the red bars the number of sites. You can see how the species has increased uh, dramatically in, in recent decades, and we now record about 1400 pairs annually. Little egret is a, a fairly common and widespread species, and we can now use the breeding bird survey to also produce a, a long term trend. So bird watchers like you and I who do BBS squares go out to our randomly selected squares twice in the breeding season and count the birds. And through that mechanism, we can see this, uh, this graph here, which shows that since 1994, when the scheme began, we've recorded an increase of 2,380. Spoonbills, also another recent colonist. And have a look at the graph here, and you can see how the species has increased dramatically since around 2010. So there were a few years where there was uh, breeding evidence being shown, but it was in 1998 in Suffolk when breeding, of, when breeding was confirmed. And this was the first confirmed breeding since uh, 1668. The next year there was a breeding record in Lancashire and Merseyside. Then over the next few years, further records in Suffolk and Dumfries and Galloway. But it was 2010 in Norfolk when the species really started to um, get a stronghold here. And if we have a look at the uh, data for 2020, we can see that 28 pairs fledged 56 young. 
and also in that year there were breeding records in Suffolk and Yorkshire and display noted in, in Scotland. Goshawks are really interesting species and has also been increasing steadily over the last couple of decades. The main strongholds are in southwest England, Wales and mid-Scotland. I suspect goshawks really under-recorded still, um, particularly in parts of uh, southeast England. So it's a species that we can all help um, go out this time of year on um, lovely sunny mornings and look out for displaying goshawks and make sure you submit the records in confidence to the county bird recorder who then collates the records and passes them on to the rare breeding bird panel. Bearded tit is a species that can show annual fluctuations. So if we have a look at the graph here, you can see the impact of cold winters in 1995 and also again in 2010, 2011. There can also be a local decline such as Leighton Moss in Lancashire in 2001, where there was severe winter flooding and poor reed setting, which impacted the local population. Quail is very well known for having these uh, quail years where we get uh, a big influx into the UK. And when we look at the graph here, we can see those years in 1989, 1997, and again in 2011. And it's thought the extreme temperature in France and Spain um, causes the birds to continue migrating north, overshooting and arriving here in the UK. Even in those really good years like 2010, when there's lots of birds, confirmed breeding evidences were still really uh, hard to come by and there were just 10 confirmed records in that year. Redback shrikes are um, declining species as we all know. It was formerly fairly uh, common and widespread species in the southern half of Britain, but by the time of the first atlas in 1968 to 72, it was already very much restricted to southeast England, with strongholds in the Brex, uh, New Forest and around the Suffolk coast. The population then continued to dwindle. So the famous pair in Santon Downer in Suffolk um, in uh, 1988, and since then there's only been sporadic breeding, with um, records being split between Devon and northern Scotland mainly. The Slavonian grebe has also been declining in recent years. This is actually a, a really well monitored species. There's lots of uh, uh, dedicated um, bird watchers up in northern Scotland who un undertake surveys of most of the key locks every year, so it's have really good annual coverage. You can see um, a drop around 93 to 94, then again uh, a low point around 2000, and again in 2010. And since then, the population stabilised a little. One of the other things that's happened to Slavonian grebe is that uh, the range has become uh, much more restricted, with places like Loch Ruthven, the RSV Reserve, being a really important um, site for them now. The field workers in Scotland are um, undertaking collaborative work with other field workers in Iceland and Norway to try and understand what's driving this population decline. Lesser spotted woodpecker was added to the panels list in 2010 as the sample size in the breeding bird survey was getting increasingly small. And we can really help here. The pan, um, data submitted to the county bird recorders and onto the panel is going to be a really important source of information in years to, go, to come in providing um, a, a short term trends. So you can submit information in the usual way to um, the county bird recorder, such as through bird track here, where you can record the location, the number of birds, um, breeding evidence, such as a, um, a pair drumming herd, for example, and you can mark the record as sensitive. By the way, East Retham, my local patch, is just wishful thinking. So how do we use rare breeding bird panel data? We can use it to help um, set conservation priorities and panel data forms an important part of the Birds of Conservation Concern Assessment. This is carried out um, every six years. And from that, we can produce a red list and an amber list. Currently, there are 25 panel species on the red list and three panel species on the amber list. This is uh, the white-tailed eagle, red wing and black red start. 
And we also have uh, six panel species listed as former breeders, such as Golden Oriole, Snowy Owl, Serin, um, Kentish Plover. Panel data also feeds into measuring the state of nature, such as the state of nature published in 2019. The panel data is included um, with um, information from all other taxa. And this uh, graphic on the right shows trends in abundance of 697 species of terrestrial and freshwater species. And it shows for the long term on the left and the short term on the right, the proportions of species that are showing uh, declines, increases or remaining largely stable. The panel data also feeds into the state of the UK's birds. This is published more or less annually um, and we can produce either short term or long term trends for 51 species. It's a very nice summary of information covering uh, sort of uh, three to four pages and provides a, a really good overview of annual information. We can also use panel data in assessing conservation action. So you'll be familiar with the bitten story. So bitterns became extinct in 1855 and then slowly started to appear again, starting off in Norfolk and building up numbers to around 80 booming males in the 1950s. Numbers then dwindled a little bit to a low point of 11 in 1997. RSPB, along with others, started to undertake um, conservation action by restoring reed beds, raising water levels and creating new habitat such as Lake and Heath Fen in Suffolk just down the road from me. And you can see how bitter numbers have responded over time up to um, every year's a record at the moment. So 2020 we had between 235 and 243 uh, booming males. Panel data can also provide really information on site conservation. So um, panel data fed, fed into this uh, review of a special protection area network and it can be used to identify um, SPAs. So how does the panel data fit into our broad suite of monitoring that we have here in the UK? We're very fortunate that we have schemes uh, that cover the most numerous um, breeding species such as the wren to the rarest like the purple sandpipers here. So the breeding bird survey covers the most common and widespread species and every year reports on around 117 species. In addition, the seabird monitoring program monitors 25 breeding seabirds from the most abundant like razorbill to the rarest like roseate tern and little tern. And we can add to that the periodic surveys covered by BTO. This covers around 10 species, for example, the woodcock survey we're running this year and a nightingale surveys we've run in the past. And then we have the scarab surveys. These are the scarce breeding bird surveys, usually um, coordinated by RSPB in conjunction with others. And this can monitor a suite of uh, 30 species over um, a, time, a time frame. So this year we have a hen harrier survey underway. Then you can see how the panel data fits in monitoring the rarest of the breeding birds and we report on around 100 species annually in a report in British birds and it's real thanks to all these organizations that we have such a wealth of monitoring schemes in the UK. Mediterranean gulls are an interesting species and in recent years we've been recording around uh, 2,000 breeding pairs and that's our threshold for a species to be on the rare breeding bird panel list. But it's really important before we take a species off the list that we're confident that long-term monitoring is in place. We're very fortunate um, that each year we receive near complete coverage of Mediterranean gulls and we can produce uh, graphs like this showing the, the increase over the last couple of um, years. But we need to be sure that the data is flowing through to the seabird monitoring program who's responsible for that long-term monitoring. So we've got some work to do around data flows there. Panel data can also be used to enable research. And this is a really nice example of um, 
a paper that was published in British Birds on the recent history of breeding marsh warblers in Britain. A partnership of local bird watchers who studied the species um, back in the day and also the um, previous secretary Mark Holling. We've also been able to use uh, quail um, data in, in a recent example and you can see here the average latitude of all records of quail in 1986 to 2011. In fact in 2014 data um, it shows that 45% uh, of all the quail records were in the northern half of Britain and you can see on that graph how in more recent years the average latitude has increased. We can also use panel data in the periodic atlases. So in Bird Atlas 2007 to 11, panel data was a really important source of information of, of breeding evidence alongside um, casual records from bird watchers, structured surveys, uh, ringing, uh, nest record data. And more recently, we've been able to use the panel data in the European Breeding Bird Atlas. We can also fulfill data requests, obviously using uh, strict uh, terms and conditions when we supply data. But you'll have heard um, in uh, Sarah and Ali's talk yesterday how panel data was used in the des designation of the Penwith Moors Triple SI. And we also have um, summary data available on the Red Breeding Bird Panel website. So you can go to explore reports and choose your species and pull out the extracts um, for you to have a look for yourself. So we do have some fantastic um, data feeding through to the Rare Breeding Bird Panel, but there are still many species for which there is uh, low to medium annual coverage. So have a look at the list of species here. And if you're fortunate enough to be out bird watching um, during the summertime in suitable breeding habitat and see any of these species, then do uh, make a special effort to record the information, send it through to the county bird recorder, and this will feed through um, to the panel. So I hope that's given you a flavour of how we use panel data and really want to thank you all the bird watchers for submitting uh, your records, the county bird recorders who collate the records and do a lot of sorting out before it's fed through to the panel and the specialist groups and individuals that also submit data. Very many thanks um, to the funders, JNTC, RSPB and BTO. Thank you. Great, thank you very much indeed, Dawn. That was really clear. Um, we do have a few questions uh, coming into the box and I'd like to encourage anybody else who wishes to question to throw them in now. Um, there's quite a good one from Tim Sharrock to begin with. Uh, I think you can probably read it, but for just to read it out, uh, he and James Ferguson Lees in the 1970s tried to predict the forthcoming colonists and he says they were spe spectacularly inept. Uh, they named none of the herons, none of the predictions that they did make. Serin, Rose Finch, and uh, Sitting Sisticola, Fantail Warbler, had become established. So would you like to say, and stick your neck out, Dawn, as to what might possibly be the next colonisers? OK, thanks, Ian. And hi, Tim. Glad you could uh, make it along this evening. Um, I'll stick my neck out and say Blythe's Reed Warbler. Um, I think it's a species that going to see maybe increasingly summering um, and maybe one day they'll breed and perhaps really far fetched would be red flank blue tail if we were going to um, be really optimistic it's a species that's been expanding particularly sort of uh, you know seen across Scandinavia so yeah maybe, maybe in 20 years time. Thanks I, I wonder also perhaps if we might get a vulture before too long the way that things are expanding in the Alps that's pretty far fetched. Um, a question um, from Mark Malia, um, asking about whether you feel that uh, reintroductions are a sensible option, perhaps to encourage uh, future breeding species, um, RBBP panel species. Are there any which are appropriate, do you think, Don? Yeah, that's an interesting question, isn't it? And it's not, it's not something as a panel we talk about, actually. Um, but I, I suppose I'm not going to say what species, because I haven't really thought about it too much, but the key questions are thinking about why the species declined in the first place and became extinct as a breeder and you know, was it habitat related and if so is the habitat there now if it was food related you know, perhaps you know thinking about redback shrike um, which is perhaps a bit of habitat and particularly large beetles um, is the food there for that species now so um, I, I guess uh, well we've got somebody coming to speak later haven't we uh, Ian Carter about redback 
uh, Red Kites, who's got a lot of experience in this area. So perhaps we can fire that question at him as well. So I guess there's another sort of peripheral issue here to do with the colonization of the country by the southern breeders. Um, clearly, little egrets and so on, all the herons are perhaps a symptom of climate change, perhaps of things going wrong with the planet. Uh, do you think that uh, this is something's message is something that we should be acknowledging more or is it simply our job to catalogue this, do you think? I think we do. I mean, to, um, in the talk this evening, I didn't really go into the drives, drivers of change for any of those species. And I suppose if we'd had longer and just focused on that, we would have then explained you know, why the species, you know, such as egrets and, well, cattle egrets, great whites, all those species, as you say, are uh, uh, probably being partly driven by climate change. So yeah, any paper, if we ever write a paper, and um, then for sure we would, we would cover all that. Uh, another question from Mark here about, um, this actually ranges a little bit into our, um, if you like species specialists that we're trying to recruit for the panel, but uh, giving advice on monitoring low density scarce breeders such as hawfinch. Um, we are trying to approach this, aren't we, with the guidance that we're placing on the website? Yeah, yeah. I also wonder whether there's sort of um, increasing opportunities around using uh, audio recording, like the audio moth, uh, maybe not for hawfinch particularly, but we, you know, we've often talked about it around crakes, for example, rare crakes, whether placing sound recorders out. And Ian, you did a lovely video for the panel, didn't you, around sort of um, long-eared owls and that kind of thing, where placing recorders out, you know, um, across sort of widespread areas of forest, marshes could um, detect those species, which Otherwise, it'd take us a very long time to cover on foot and lots of late nights. I, I see that uh, Humphreys um, suggested bee eater as a species bee eater, yeah. to become regular. I think that's a pretty reasonable kind of uh, suggestion, don't you? Again, yeah, very much uh, climate driven as well. I was wondering with the example of the marsh warbler that you gave the, the analysis paper there, um, what we have to do to our data holdings to make these kind of papers more um, common, more frequent, to be able to uh, go in and plumb the, the depths of our database much more than we have done? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I challenged Mark Eaton last night about what, what the biggest challenges for the panel were in, in the next few years. And he talked about sort of the data cleaning that we've been doing over the last few years. And we've got more to do sort of um, around um, sites. So yeah, removing any duplicates. Um, so I think, yeah, clean, cleaning the data, having a really robust data, uh, database data set. And yeah, it really opens up many opportunities for further analysis. I'll take a very quick question from uh, Malcolm, another former uh, panel member and secretary. Um, are we planning another report on the numbers of non-native breeding birds in the U native birds breeding in the UK? The yes. Answer, yes. <laughs> That's that's quite straightforward. Thanks, Malcolm. But as Neil Bucknell says, on a non on a less positive note, uh, what do you think will soon qualify as our BBP species as a result of continued declines? Oh yes, yeah. um, that's quite tricky, isn't it? Oh, well, we talked about some of these uh, scarcer well species. A long way off yet. Yeah, you know, wood warbler we touched on last night, for example, and some of the woodland species that are declining. But it's something as a panel we have a uh, a re review at least once a year, don't we? We we go through the species which are sort of edging that way. We should uh, be looking out for. Okay. Um. There's a final question. I think I'll take. Just I guess it's a general reflection, Dawn. But thermal imaging technology and I suppose other new technologies are they helping us or are they not? I mean, we're thinking about potentially looking at drone guidance in relation to monitoring rare breeding birds. Thermal imaging we haven't thought about yet, but certainly lots of people are using it. Do you think it's something that's going to play a bigger part in panel work in the future? Yeah, potentially. I was just trying to think um, off the top of my head what species that would be helpful for that, you know, you couldn't see or hear during the breeding season. I think I have to think about that one a little longer. But yeah, I think you know, a lot of this uh, novel technology does have a role. I think for me, sound recording is probably one area we haven't explored. Uh, enough yet in relation to detecting these scarce um, breeding birds. Sure, and passive acoustic monitoring certainly is something that I think yeah. has a great future. Great, thank you very much indeed, Dawn, that's brilliant, and thanks for those who posted the questions in the box. Um, keep them coming for the next speaker. And uh, our next speaker is Amy Chalice, um, and Amy is the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Coordinator 
um, and has worked for the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Scheme since 2014. Her role is to drive the scheme forward under the guidance of the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Group. She's passionate about nature conservation and has worked for the RSPB in various roles across the UK. So I'd like to welcome Amy to speak to us now. Good evening. I'm Amy Chalice, the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Coordinator. I'm hosted with BTO Scotland and have been working for the scheme since 2014. I was delighted when Mark invited me to speak on the work of the scheme as part of marking RBVP's 50th anniversary celebrations. In my presentation this evening, I want to give you a brief introduction to the scheme, recognise the importance of RBVP to the work of the scheme, and share with you the Raptor trends that we were able to publish in November to coincide with the scheme's own 20th anniversary celebrations. So, firstly, who are we? The scheme is now a partnership of these eight organisations, including non-governmental organisations, volunteer-led organisations and statutory agencies, and I'm sure these logos will be familiar to most of you. All the partner organisations that comprise the scheme either actively involved in monitoring raptors or in collecting and or publishing survey information about raptors. The scheme monitors all the breeding raptor species native to Scotland. So we've got nine species of hawks, buzzards, eagles, kites and harriers, four species of falcon, osprey, which is in a family all of its own, and the largely nocturnal raptors, the five species of owl. You might also be surprised to hear that we monitor ravens part of the scheme. While not strictly a raptor, the scheme, the scheme have adopted raven as an honorary raptor species, as it's ecologically similar to some raptors, being a top predator, a scavenger, and a long-lived species. Raptor monitoring has been going on in Scotland for many decades, long before the scheme came into existence in 2002. The first Scottish Raptor Study Group branches came into being in the 1980s when groups of committed volunteer raptor surveyors formed regional groups to coordinate fieldwork for national surveys of golden eagle and peregrine falcon. These groups provided a forum for exchange of information on survey techniques and began to collect and collate valuable long-term data sets for raptors. The vast majority of people currently monitoring raptors and contributing data to the scheme are volunteers and are members of the Scottish Raptor Study Group. There were 12 separate branches across Scotland, all coming under the Scottish Raptor Study Group umbrella. About 360 Scottish Raptor Study Group members are actively involved in monitoring raptors all across Scotland. Many individuals have been operating studies of raptors in particular areas for many years, long before the scheme was established. And these long term studies are really important, as you'll see shortly. The partnership between SRMS and RBVP is a strong and important one, as both organisations provide the facts and robust information about birds of prey in Scotland. RBVP have been involved with the scheme since the outset. This picture shows representatives of the seven original partners who met in Perthshire to sign the formal agreement to launch the scheme back in 2002. You'll see here some probably familiar faces from the panel. We've got Malcolm Oglivy, who originally represented RBVP, but also fellow members. David Stroud, who represented JNCC on the SRMS steering group up to his retirement from JNCC. And also Mark Collin, who originally represented SOC on the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Scheme, but who represented RBVP on the scheme steering group between 2006 and 2020. SRMS data are the principal source of breeding records used by RBVP in its annual report, and you can see the list of relevant species here. In turn, RBVP shared with the scheme Schedule 1 Raptor records that have reached them so that they can be taken account of in the SRMS annual reporting figures. Probably of even greater value to the scheme is the wealth of experience that RBVP representatives bring to the SRMS steering group table to contribute to progressing and developing the work of the scheme. One of the key objectives of the scheme is to provide robust information on Scottish raptor populations to determine trends in number, range, survival and productivity, and to understand the causes of population change. 
Survival is much harder to monitor as it involves much more intensive work. And so far, the scheme has concentrated on producing trends in breeding numbers and productivity. In November, we were delighted to be able to publish trends for many SRMS species, which is a culmination of the efforts of over 800 data contributors. I thought I'd spend a bit of time taking you through this work this evening. I should at this point give particular mention to my colleague Mark Wilson at BTO, who led on this trends analysis. And the trends analysis covers the period from 2009 to 2018. So what are trends for? The trends can actually be very useful. The BTO's flagship monitoring scheme, the Breeding Bird Survey, is mainly aimed at delivering population trends which are communicated by a wide range of reports, newsletters, scientific papers and popular articles. Annual trends allow us to take the pulse of bird populations alerting us to problems as they arise. Even when these are problems we already know about, trends can help us communicate these to agencies, government and the wider public, putting solid evidence behind our understanding. They can also have a range of other uses, including helping us to understand drivers of population changes and what might be done to manage these to conserve raptors more effectively. So here are just a few examples of BBS trends. In the top left, you can see the BBS trend for curlew in Scotland. BBS trends have played a really crucial part in detecting and demonstrating the scale of breeding weight declines in recent decades. The remaining pictures here are all examples of raptor trends. So for barn owl, it's the only U a UK level trend BBS is available. For some of the commonest species of raptors, such as buzzard and raven shown here, there are Scottish BBS trends, but these are not broken down by regions. It's important to recognise that BBS has several limitations when it comes to monitoring and producing trends for raptors. So BBS just looks at trends in numbers, but it can't be used to produce trends in any of the measures of productivity. Specific raptor monitoring approaches, however, are designed to separate breeding numbers and metrics productivity. Secondly, the methods of BBS are not well suited to surveying raptors. The encounter rates for raptors are much lower on transit, transects, which gives lower statistical power for detecting trends. The rarer raptor species are also encountered far too infrequently in BBS surveys to be able to produce trends for them. And finally, it's generally difficult to separate breeding adults from non-breeding juveniles, so BBS includes them both. While for the SRMS, we get a good handle on breeding adults, but, they're not, but not the non-breeding ones. So, in this latest analysis, we aim to produce trends for breeding numbers, that's the number of breeding pairs, and also trends for a range of productivity parameters, as you can see here. So these included breeding success, clutch size, brood size, and also the number of fledglings. Overall, the scheme ambitions to produce national, that's Scottish, trends of fully representatives of the Scottish populations of each species and to then produce regional scale trends. The regional trends we broke Scotland down into two different ways, as depicted here. So on the left, we've got SRMS regions, which effectively equate to the SRSG branch regions. And on the right, we have natural heritage zones, which break Scotland down into different biogeographic areas, and these are largely used by the statutory bodies such as NatureScot. To be able to produce robust trends, you do need to consider carefully which data are suitable for trends analysis. And in order to produce a trend, we need to have a big enough sample size that changes are likely to be picked up. We also need to be confident that the information we're using is representative of the areas we're making trends for. And for trends in numbers in particular, we need to have a good understanding of coverage in the areas surveyed. So these maps illustrate the distribution of data coming into BBS and SRMS in recent years. The spread of data achieved by growth is pretty impressive, but sampling effort is clearly uneven in both surveys, concentrated in certain areas. However, the fact that BBS squares are assigned randomly from different regions and that all squares receive comparable survey effort makes it, makes it relatively straightforward to turn BBS data into trends. This is what BBS was designed to do, but SRMS is very different. 
Collecting data on raptors is typically a much more intensive activity than the monitoring effort from the BBS that SMS draws on comes from a wide variety of different studies that were set up to do a variety of worthwhile things, but were mostly not designed from current first principles to yield trends. So we had a two-step process for identifying areas that could be used for trends. Firstly, we looked at the records themselves to identify areas where the spacing of the home ranges suggested coverage within an area was high. And this was informed by knowledge of distances between nesting ranges of each species from the literature. And we then had a period of consultation with data contributors to sense check the trends we'd produced and omitted any that were deemed non-rigorous. Of the 20 species which the scheme regularly reports on annually, we've been able to produce trends for 14. And here you can see the six SMS species that we've not been able to produce any trends for. These trends tend to be very rare breeders and or difficult to monitor species that are recorded too infrequently or inconsistently by SMS contributors to allow production of trends currently. In the next few slides, I'm going to hone in on some of the trends we have been able to produce for just two species as examples of what we've been able to produce. I'm going to start with white-tailed eagle. White-tailed eagle are one of two reintroduced species that we have here in Scotland. So a quick history on them for you. Um, unfortunately, they went extinct in 1917. However, since the mid-1970s, there's been a programme to reintroduce them. Firstly on rum between 1975 and 1985, in Western Ross in the 1990s, and more recently to the east coast of Scotland. White-tailed eagle is the only species for which we've been able to produce national trend in numbers. As you might hope for with a reintroduced population, the number of breeding pairs has increased linearly through time by 5.4% a year. Up until the last few years of the trend period, this species was monitored quite comprehensively. So this is the only species for which we drew on all the records that we held in our database for trends in breeding numbers, not just those that we'd identified as being in clusters. Here we can see the regional trends that we've been able to produce at an SRMS regional level. The increase in numbers of breeding pairs at a national level is reflected in the trend for Argyle where there's been a 5.8% annual increase over the trend period. The three other regions for which trends were possible did not detect a significant change. Perhaps these other regions have reached capacity with breeding pairs, or perhaps there's something else going on linked to the smaller sample sizes. Breeding success of white-tailed eagle has not changed significantly in any of the three regions for which trends could be produced, so that's Argyle, Highland, and Lewis and Harris. It is going to be trickier to monitor this species in the future. We will need a means of picking up the new pairs that are settling away from the core areas of distribution. The species we'll take a quick look at next is Hen Harrier. This map shows the clusters of home ranges from which sufficient data were reported to attempt to derive trends and breeding numbers from Hen Harrier over the trends period. Despite being a species that is well monitored and receives a lot of attention from its existing scheme contributors, a national trend has simply not been possible with SRMS data. You can see, for example, that Caithness and East Sutherland hen harrier populations are obvious gaps. We have, however, been able to produce trends in breeding numbers and productivity for some regions. Where significant trends have been detected, they are negative rather than positive. So we can see in these plots significant decreases in both Highland and South Strathclyde. This slide is just giving you an overview of the trends that we've been able to produce for the number of breeding pairs for different species region combinations, which you can study at your own leisure in our report. So figures in brackets indicate the national changes with significant increases highlighted in green, significant decreases highlighted in blue, and non-significant changes highlighted in grey. Dashes indicate where um, the species occurs, but no trend is available. Um, NL indicates non-linear trends, and ABS indicates where the species is not known to breed. It's also important to note that for many of our trends, we have attached caveats to them, which should be borne in mind when considering the trends. So for example, we've highlighted when the trend been based on a particularly small sample size. 
this slide alone hints that there's still a lot of work to do if the schemes to achieve um, being able to produce national trends for any SRMS species and the dashes in this table in hint at where the scope to work with existing and new data contributors is like to make it more likely that we'll be able to produce regional and national trends in the future. To see all the detail of this work, please visit the scheme website. Here you can access an electronic copy of our summary trends report and also a technical report summarising the detailed methods used in the analysis. You can also access separate documents explaining the trends in the numbers of breeding pairs and each of the productivity measures across the range of different species and regions. You can explore trends interactively on an app and you're able to toggle between SRMS regions, national heritage zones and then select the species parameter and up to two regions to compare the trends for. Congratulations RBPP on your 50th anniversary. Thanks for your involvement in the scheme over the last two decades and I look forward to continuing to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much Amy and um, apologies at the end I think there's possibly a little bit of a glitch with the uh, the video just for the last 10 seconds. I'm not quite sure whether that was shared by everybody else. But anyway, we could hear what you were saying perfectly clearly at the very end. Um, thanks for explaining to everybody um, what is essentially, I suppose, a unique situation for Scotland and a model which I hope we can see replication of elsewhere in the UK. It's uh, certainly made massive advance to the way that we can record and conserve raptors in, in Scotland, that's for sure. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, she, you may well be able to see them, but um, Humphrey's asking a question which possibly may be a statistical question more than a white-tailed eagle question, but it's, he's asking if the entire population is monitored every year, why, uh, why are there such wide confidence intervals for their trends? Hi, excuse me, sorry. Uh, yes, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, that's quite a technical question. I didn't run the analysis myself, so I can't give you a very specific answer in terms of the, the wideness of this, the, those confidence limits. Um, but I think it's just important to recognise with the white-tailed eagle population that we're increasingly kind of losing control of it a bit in terms of the number of pairs that are actually being monitored out there in Scotland just now. There's new pairs popping up everywhere um, all the time so it's going to be a fascinating species to watch over the next few years just to see how how that population does continue to expand there um, yes I wish my colleague Mark Wilson who actually ran the analysis would be able to give a bit more of a technical answer to that question should he be sitting in this seat tonight so I can potentially come back to you on that one um, in due course okay thanks very much Amy um, I was wondering personally whether um you could explain what's being done to try and foster the next generation, if you like, of raptor monitors, uh, trying to ensure that raptor study groups are still able to do this in 10, 20 years time. I know there's been work underway to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's worth saying volunteers are, you know, critical to the work of the scheme. They're the bedrock. It's the guys out there on the ground, guys and girls, I should say, out there doing all that hard work and putting that hard graft in. So obviously we do need to foster um, and, and build people up into the future. So obviously the key, the scheme itself is, you know, keen to support the ongoing Scottish Raptor Study Group structure that's out there and support all those volunteers. But we're also doing a lot of work um, to develop our own initiative called Raptor Patch, um, which is effectively a bit of an entry level scheme to get more people involved in monitoring some of the more widespread raptor species. So things like sparrowhawk, buzzard, kestrel and raven. And we're really interested to hear from people that might be interested in taking on monitoring of those particular species and recognizing they're not currently rbbp species but they are you know these widespread species that it's re really valuable to collect more information going forward in terms of production of, of robust trends into the future so that's something to to look out for if there's people looking to get involved Thanks. And I didn't miss Larry's question. I thought I'd save it to the end as a perfect segue to the following speaker. But Larry's yeah. saying, is there something going wrong for red kites in the Highland region? If so, what? Um, is that off the back? I'm just wondering what's triggered that question. Um, is it the fact that we've maybe... Um, Highland, let's see. 
so we, are you picking up on this decreasing trend i'm guessing in yes. and numbers of breeding pairs in the highland that's what yep. we've spotted there yep. so uh, cl clearly there's a signal there that there is potentially something going going on with red kites um through this analysis we've not gone in to try to interpret and make interpretations of the biology behind any of these trends that are displaying to us um, at the moment but we, there's a signal there that there's something worth looking at and I wouldn't want to sit here tonight and postulate what that might might be but yeah that's a what minus 10.8 percent decrease in breeding numbers so it is something to be to be aware of um, and something to look at um, in the future. Sure yeah thank you very much um, so we'll probably get some comeback on that in a moment but um certainly persecution is one thing that's been suggested but thanks very much amy that's great and uh we'll move on to our next speaker so thanks very much for giving us that talk um and it is a link into the next speaker um ian carter and ian retired early after 25 years as an ornithologist with natural england and he was of course very closely involved with the red kite reintroduction program from its very beginning and he's been involved with natural england's hen harrier recovery project he now spends his time watching and writing about wildlife and has written several very well regarded books. We look forward now to hearing Ian talk about red kites. Okay, so uh, the red kite, uh, Britain's most successful raptor. Uh, I'll try and answer that question or at least give you my um, my take on that question by the by the end of the talk. Um, First off, just a quick thank you uh, to, to Dan Powell uh, for the artwork that I'm, I'm using throughout, uh, which is taken from our, our our joint book that we did together, The Red Kites Year. Okay, so I'll start with a quick history about of the bird in, in Britain. Uh, we know it was a very common and widespread bird. It occurred in both urban and rural areas. And we've got evidence from a, a variety of different sources. Uh, there's the old names uh, that were used for this bird, uh, putter, gleed, various others, and they find their way into base names. Um, they're scattered throughout the country, but you know the red kite turns up in the names of some towns and towns and villages. We've got first-hand accounts uh, from observers that actually watched the birds you know, even hundreds of years ago uh, and wrote down what they saw including, for example, in sort of medieval London, uh, there's accounts of, sort of flocks of kites scavenging on the streets. And then there's bounty payments. Um, you know, this was a bird that was so common that people were actually paid uh, to encourage them uh, to kill it. So we know it was a, a common and widespread bird. Uh, we'll probably never know for sure, but I think there's a really good chance. I think it's a safe bet that it was once on most London bird of prey yeah, in Britain. Um, but sadly, you know, we went from this um, common widespread bird uh, scavenging uh, close to our sort of settlements, taking advantage of our scraps and, and handouts uh, to this. Uh, and, and the map here is taken from Simon Holloway's excellent book, The Historical Atlas, and all the E's there are E for extinction. Uh, by the end of the 1800s, it had gone completely from England, uh, it had gone completely from Scotland, and it clung on in, in central Wales, remote parts of central Wales, where it did get down to just a handful of breeding birds uh, in, the, in the 1930s and 40s. So it came very close to complete extinction. And really, this was because primarily of human persecution along with a lot of other predatory mammals and, and raptors, it was seen as a threat to livestock and especially to game birds. Uh, and it was, it was persecuted relentlessly. Uh, so where are we today then? Um, so we've got the reintroduction project. Uh, kites have been brought back to England and to Scotland by taking young birds from the nest in parts of Europe where they're still common, bringing them back to to the release pens, uh, and these two are, are in pens in Rockingham Forest uh, in Northamptonshire, uh, and then releasing them into the wild. You probably can't read the detail on this, but really the, the map is just to give you an idea of the different 
release site. So I think there's nine release sites in total. Started back in 1989 in the Chilterns and the Black Isle. And since then, there have been these various, various different projects. The last one, I think, was Cumbria, which finished, I think, in 2012. And at each of these sites, between roughly 70 and 100 birds would be released into the wild uh, to get populations established. So this is a little bit dated, but it gives you a pretty good idea uh, of the distribution. Uh, and a few things to note here, uh, you can see that the Welsh population, the, the, the native uh, Welsh population has now spread out uh, into, into Western England. Uh, you can see the population is doing really, really well in the south, the southern England, the Chilterns birds, and also the Midlands, and those, those populations have now, have now merged together. Um, and then you've got the smaller populations dotted around centred on the release sites uh, in further north in England and Scotland. Um, but it's still patchy. Uh, there's still large parts of the country even now where it's just a rare visitor. Maybe there's the odd pair that breeds, but it's still very, very scarce and you don't see too many kites. So although it's been doing really well, it still has got a long way to go in terms of spreading back throughout, uh, throughout Britain. This is a real guesstimate, I'm afraid. Uh, we have lost track of the numbers uh, of birds, various estimates knocking around. Uh, I did, uh, I put an estimate together for the for the red kites year a few years ago, which I think was five to six thousand. It really is guessing, but I mean seven or eight thousand is not unrealistic, and the vast majority of those will be in the southern half of the country, with the Welsh birds and then uh, the birds in central. Uh, and southern England. So it's doing really well uh, and when, let's have a look at why that is uh, and I think the first thing to say is that it's just a really flexible adaptable bird. Uh, it'll eat almost anything from earthworms and beetles you know really right at the small end up to scavenging on livestock carcasses when it gets the chance so the really big stuff as well. It'll take advantage of, of human activities, so you get birds following uh, agricultural operations, you get them scavenging on landfill sites, they're quite happy scavenging on, on, on carcasses, uh, they'll snatch up bits of food from, from the ground so they can take advantage of road kills. So yeah, uh, it's, it's a real, really adaptable, flexible bird, perhaps eats a wider range of food than any other bird of prey in Europe, I would say. And then you've also got the food that people are actually putting out specifically for the kites. So there's a lot of feeding in gardens, particularly down in the, in the Chilterns, uh, where kites are very common. People put food scraps out in the gardens, the kites will come dive down and take advantage. Uh, Reading University have done some really good work to look at this and look at the impacts of this. Uh, uh, particularly in the urban centre of Reading and I think the surrounding towns. So that's, that can provide a significant amount of food. And then you've got the, the, the specific feeding sites uh, set up for, uh, for specifically for red kites. So this one's just up the road at Bellymac Farm in Galloway, but there's others in Wales. So it can attract hundreds and hundreds of birds uh, and, and, you know, make sure they're well fed. Um, every single day of the year. So that, that, can, that can make a difference. Uh, the kite, as I said, it's a very flexible bird. That's not just in terms of the food that it eats, but also nest sites. So again, you probably can't quite see this, but there's those large pine trees are in a garden on the edge of a town uh, in the Chilterns, and there's a kite nest near the top with a, with a, if you can make it out, with a kite sort of sitting on, on the nest there. So they're quite happy on the urban fringes, not only feeding, but also um, the nest sites. So, so, so they're really flexible in terms of, of, of the way they use habitats. Okay, so just for a minute, consider the wider perspective then. So this is the, the, and the global range is restricted within Europe. 
the yellow is where they're um, migratory and a lot of those birds will move south and southwest for the for the winter the red is the um, the, the resident populations and so a few things to note here then um, so the biggest population is Germany the estimate there nine to fourteen thousand pairs you note that Britain now is comfortably the second most important population, which is amazing when you think of the, the recent history. And then you've got a few other countries there with, with sizable populations. Again, note the patchy distribution that comes back to this point of heat making, that if kites are left alone, they can do really, really well and increase and, and spread. But if they are persecuted, they are especially vulnerable to persecution and they can struggle. And you can see in the list of countries there, the trends um, is increasing and doing well in some countries, but there are actually declines in other countries, including quite important populations. So it's not all a, a success story if we think about the wider picture. Uh, again, these, these are a bit of a, a sort of guesstimated figures, but it gives you a rough idea. The global population is around about uh, 30,000 pairs and now Britain perhaps supports as much as a quarter of the total global population. So on to some of the threats then um, and the big one is illegal persecution, the use of poison baits. So they're, they're not always aimed at kites, they're sometimes put out for foxes or for uh, for carrying crows perhaps, but the kites are highly efficient scavengers, often first on the scene with predictable results. So, so that's a, a significant problem. They're also quite easy birds to shoot. They spend a lot of time in the air. They've got quite a slow, sort of languid foraging flight, often low over the ground, and they can even be quite curious of people. And they'll fly across and come and see if there's a sort of feeding opportunity. Um, so that does make them easy birds to, to shoot. Uh, ignore the, the dates on here. This is another uh, dated slide, but it's a trend that's worth looking at here. And this trend has continued up to the present day. Um, Chilterns and the Black Isle, the first two release projects, the same number of birds released over pretty much the same time period. And in the Chilterns, you've got a rapid increase, perhaps up to 5,000 pairs. That would be the rough, rough guesstimate now. The Black Isle, they breed just as successfully up there, um, but the population has really, really struggled and it's closer to 100 pairs. The difference is because the Black Isle is close to intensive uh, grouse moors and the levels of persecution are that much higher. So instead of having four to 5,000 pairs, you've got 100 pairs. So it's worth remembering, I think, when you think about the impacts of grouse moors, we think about hen harriers and we think about golden eagles, but actually I think how many birds must have been killed over the years um, to prevent a population becoming established. Uh, and you do get persecution in the Chilterns, but it's just that much lower levels and the birds are able to, able to cope with it. Some other threats briefly, um, rat, modern rat poisons, highly toxic rat poisons uh, can be an issue. The kites are, uh, are scavenging on rodents that have been killed by the, the poisons, they can also be killed. Lead shot still unbelievably after all these years, we're still using lead, it goes into the, the things that are shot and again the kites being scavengers can ingest a lethal dose, so that, that can be an issue too. Uh, wind farms, uh, probably quite a minor problem, but again, as a highly aerial bird, they spend a lot of time in the air. Uh, and you can see what's happened to this bird. It's been it's like it's sort of made of out of a piece of paper, the way the blades have just sliced, sliced through it. So, you know, lose some birds as a result of uh, an increase in, in wind farms. OK, so yeah, back to the final. Uh, back to that original question then um that we the one that we started with is it our most successful bird um well i think it once was almost certainly our most common and abundant bird of prey uh i think it could easily become so again because of the flexibility that i've talked about 
because it can exploit both urban and rural habitats, uh, because it also takes advantage of handouts provided deliberately for kites. And then if you look at some of the densities you've got in parts of the Chilterns, up to a sort of six airs per square kilometre, and then you look at all the suitable habitat that there is available for red kites, I think there's a good chance it could become our most common bird of prey uh, in the future. Certainly, you know, 50,000 pairs wouldn't be at all surprising. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the most abundant bird of prey at the moment is the buzzard, and the estimates are 65 to 80,000 pairs, I think. I think the cut's got a good chance of, of overtaking that in the future. But obviously getting to that getting to that stage is going to take time. It's a highly social bird. They like breeding close to others of their own kind, so they can be quite slow to spread into new areas. And of course, we need to tackle these problems uh, with illegal persecution, particularly poisoning, if we want the sort of recovery um, that I think you know we should otherwise expect. Okay, just a final thank you again to Dan for the fantastic artwork. Uh, and some of the themes I've, I've touched on today are explored in a bit more detail uh, in, our, in our recent book, The Red Kites Year. So yeah, check that out if you want a bit more information. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ian. That was excellent. And surely the kind of success story that we ought to be looking for for rare breeding birds. I mean, clearly it very, once, very much emphatically was a rare breeding bird panel species, and now it emphatically isn't. And so it's gone exactly in the right direction. But as is always the case with increasing birds of prey, it brings um, certain amounts of uh, criticism, comment and questions. And we've got a few questions in the chat. Um, I think we'll probably try and divide them up into two categories. First thing is to do with what kites eat. And there's a couple of questions, one from Murray Orchard and one from um, Humphrey Crick. Uh, about the impacts of kites on, for example, ground nesting birds. Is this um, significant? And does this go support the, the contention that some say that there are too many kites now for some other species? And the second part to that is eating game birds, particularly live pheasants and partridges. To what extent do they do that? So two questions there rolled into one, Ian, if you can, if you're with us. Yep, yes, if you can hear me okay. Yep. Yeah, um, so on the, the wader front, I mean, they're, they certainly cut, they're, they're as adaptable, as I said, so they, they're not going to take large, they're not going to kill large birds. I think your pheasant poults are pretty safe, even your adult partridges are pretty safe. Um, but chicks, sorry, I just need to start this video. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that, so the chi uh, game bird chicks and also wader chicks, they certainly will take opportunistically. Um, so I think there have been problems, uh, the name escapes me, there's an RSPB reserve near Oxford, uh, sort of lowland wet grassland, I think they've had issues there with kites coming in and helping themselves to the wader chicks, I think they've done stuff to try and tackle that uh, by supplementary feeding to try and keep the um, any problem birds away from the, the reserve, so you know there, there, there can be issues there as there can be with other, uh, you know, other predatory species. But on the game bird side of it, uh, yeah, I don't think there's significant problems there. Certainly, pheasant rearing, I think, is pretty secure. No doubt, grouse moor owners would have issues potentially if you've got lots of kites flying over the moor that they might help themselves to the odd, the odd grouse chick. And, and obviously, there is a big issue with persecution there. Um, but generally, I, I don't think there's going to be too many problems there. OK, thanks. And then there's another couple of questions which are the opposite side of the question. Rather than what kites eat, uh, what about people feeding kites directly? Um, what do you think about, well, should people feed them? Should they be encouraged to feed them? And what do you think about the impact of the feeding stations, perhaps on um, other naturally breeding birds in the area where feeding stations are present? Yeah, it's a really tricky one. It's really contentious, especially in the Shieldsons. It's become very contentious. And there have been all sorts of lurid newspaper headlines about kites diving down and snatching custard creams from the hands of toddlers and that sort of thing. Um, and not everybody's a fan of the, the birds. Um, so if someone is feeding in a garden, putting food out every day, and they've got 20 or 30 kites swooping down and the next door neighbour isn't that keen on them, there can be issues. My personal take on it is that 
I don't see a particular problem with it if it's done properly. And there are sort of guidelines out there that various organisations have published about feeding responsibly, you know, the right kind of foods for the kites, taking into account the views of neighbours and maybe not going overboard and feeding huge amounts. So I think if it's done sensibly, after all, we feed a whole range of other of other garden birds. You know, what if people get pleasure from it? Why not feed kites? But the other issue, the feeding stations um, and Gigrin can attract sort of three, four hundred birds a day. Uh, the one just up the road from from me now in Galloway, the Bellymac Farm. I, I went there the other day and there was easily a hundred birds there. People suggest it might stop them and from spreading and slow the rates of spread. I tend to see it the other way around. You know, I think these feeding stations are in probably improving survival rates and productivity in the breeding season. So if you're if you're doing that, you're more kites are surviving. Uh, they're rearing more young in the longer term. That presumably is going to age spread because eventually they're going to have to push out and spread to new areas. So I take the point that in the short term, perhaps it can slow down the rates of spread but in the longer term i think it's probably a a, a positive thing great thank you very much um we've got quite a few other questions which we won't have time to deal with um, unfortunately maybe we can find a way of getting answers to the people who've asked them after the event we'll talk to you about that um but otherwise um once again thank you very much indeed uh, ian for that talk it's really interesting and obviously elicited a lot of interest um, so I think we'll just pause for a break now um, and we'll be resuming at quarter past eight. Um, if you're able to um, do watch the uh, the rare breeding bird video in the intermission, but otherwise we'll see you back here at quarter past eight. Thank you.
Welcome back everybody. That was a great video there that was put together by Mark Eaton. Uh, some fantastic stuff in there as was commented on and certainly I look forward to enhanced coverage of uh, marsh warblers this year. That would be great. Moving on um, in the second part of the evening. Um, we now have the, the great pleasure of welcoming Ken Smith to talk to us. Ken and his wife Linda run the Woodpecker Network with a focus on encouraging interest in the declining lesser spotted woodpecker. Prior to his retirement, Ken had a distinguished career in, in research at the RSPB and was a member of the Rare Breeding Birds panel for many years, including 15 years as chair. So we look forward to hearing about lesser spotted woodpeckers, Ken. Oh, hi, I'm very pleased to be with you this evening to talk about lesser spotted woodpeckers. Uh, specifically, one of, what I want to talk about is the role of rare breeding of the panel in the monitoring of lesser spots. Um, I'm not going to do much about ecology of lesser spots and why they're declining, and that's another talk. Um, so I'm focusing on the role of rare breeding of the panel this evening. Now, I've been involved with the panel for quite a long time. I was a member for many years, and in recent last few years, I've been the species advisor on lesser spotted woodpecker. My involvement in woodpeckers goes back a long way, um, started in the 1980s, but it was only in 2015 that with my wife Linda we started um, Woodpecker Network uh, to encourage the study of woodpeckers in general, um, but especially focused on lesser spotted woodpecker. Um, we really felt that the monitoring of the species had really dropped off, um, it was falling off people's radar really, and we needed to generate a bit more interest to um, keep things going. So the prime aim were to collect, was to collect data on lesser spotted woodpecker breeding success because it was already thought that this was too low and this was one of the drivers of the decline. And um, we've done that pretty well over the last few years and we would submit data to the BTO nest record scheme and to a rare breeding bird panel. Um, but initially we weren't really uh, focused on monitoring numbers or anything like that. Uh, just as an indication of how well we've done in the last few years, um, these are the number of nest records for lesser spotted woodpeckers submitted each year from 83 through to 2022. Um, the black lines are the ones um, submitted uh, before Woodpecker Network started uh, through the usual channels, um, usually bumbling along between five and ten each year. There was a peak in 2007 when RSPB um, started some um, research projects on lesser spot, uh, but then it was dropping right off. And so we came in in 2015, and you can see we've got the numbers of uh, nests found and monitored each year up to say 15 or 20 now. And since 2015, we've monitored 115 nests. And the distribution of those nests is shown there on the right, um, which pretty much covers the uh, 
the UK range of uh, lesser spotted woodpecker with uh, nests all over the place covering that whole range, but a big clump down there in the middle of the south, uh, which is the new forest where we've monitored over 40 nests now in the last few years. And I'll come back to the new forest later in the talk. The red breeding panel, but a panel started monitoring lesser spots in 2020. Um, this was driven by the small population size, the Avian Population Estimates Panel, APEP, um, came up with an estimate of 600 territories around this time, in a paper published in BB, I think. Um, so low numbers, the population was clearly declining, and it was also clear that it was not very well monitored. So there was clearly a role for the rare breeding bird panel for this species. Um, along the bottom there, we've got some of the data. Um, the BTO uh, used to produce this uh, common bird census trend for the lesser spotted woodpecker, which started in 66, went through a peak in the late 70s. Um, that increase there is pretty clear. It was pretty clearly related to Dutch elm disease and the increase of food in the environment resulting from that. But then a steady decline and then got to 2000 and the BTO felt there weren't enough lesser spots being picked up by the monitoring and they could no longer produce a reliable index. Uh, the other monitoring system in place are the periodic atlases and here we've got the in the middle here the breeding distribution 2008 and 11 showing it's very much southern England and Wales based um, a lot through the southeast a lot in the Welsh marches um, and then in Scotland and Ireland um, but on the right there is the uh, change map from that atlas and the black squares indicate the changes from the two previous atlases and so you can see there's a lot of black 10 kilometer squares in East Anglia and through Middle England and the Southwest and in the Northwest, um, but still pink through Southeast England and the marches. Um, but of course, presence on a 10K square basis is quite a crude measure. A few weeks ago, I think about three weeks ago now, the BTO um, produced its new bird facts web pages. Now, if you haven't seen these, it's a fantastic resource. It really is brilliant. You ought to go and have a look. Uh, but I couldn't resist having a look at what they were now saying about lesser spots. And two things that are clear on the left here um, is the change in distribution. So what the BTO have done is, is put those atlas changes in number of occupied 10k squares onto a graph here. So these are the number of 10k squares with lesser spots in the three atlases. And so in the last atlas, it was 560 10K squares. Now, to my mind, this means that that avian population estimate of 600 territories had to be far too low. Uh, it's inconceivable that there was only one pair of lesser spotted woodpeckers in each 10K square in that atlas time. And so subsequently with Rob Clements and Linda, we actually analyzed all the published tetrad atlases for uh, England and Wales really. And um, there are a lot of them um, all over the place, took a bit of rounding up. Um, and we came up with a conservative estimate of about 2000 territories during that atlas period. And that could, could be um, quite low really, but we'll, a lot more than the 600. So the number of territories is certainly higher than 600. Um, also, the BTO on the right here has, have produced a new trend graph. And so they've extended this trend um, through um, to now, really. Now, this is quite valuable and it shows the, the big extent of the decline. The decline has carried on. Um, but I have to be a bit nervous about this um, because having said uh, a decade or two ago, there weren't enough um, birds being counted to produce an index. I mean, you have to question what's going on now. And I've had a look at the BTO website and things. And when you look, when you go on to the species text for lesser spot, um, there's a whole load of caveats about this trend. Um, it's actually saying that the trend is pretty unreliable and really um, we should be looking to the rare breeding panel to monitor the species. Uh, and the reason it's unreliable is in these last few years, um, 
the breeding bird survey, which is now the main breeding bird monitoring scheme, is only picking up between 20, 10 and 20 records per year of lesser spot. Um, so even though you've got this graph that looks quite sensible, um, it's not very helpful in predicting what might go forward. So I can see there's massive value in seeing what's happened in the past and that big decline. Um, but whether given the data in the last 10 years or so, we'd actually be able to pick up any real trends um, with any confidence um, is questionable. So I th think rare breeding per panel still has a big role. Why is the lesser spot such a birding challenge? Well, um, it's a really difficult bird to find and see. It's small. Um, it's now quite rare and limited in distribution, so you have to know where to go. If you go out bird watching at random, you're unlikely to come across one. It spends its whole life in the tops of trees. So when there are no leaves on, that's fine. But for the majority of the year, when there are leaves on the trees, that makes it pretty tough. Um, Calling and drumming of these birds now is uh, only for a short period of the year and it's not very reliable. So you can go to a wood one day and not hear or see, hear or see them and then go the next and there they are. So that's quite tricky. The other factor is that they're most detectable in February and March. So now is the time to be out doing lesser spots. Um, and most breeding bird surveys haven't started then. You know, the normal season is April to get started. So lesser spot, along with a few other woodland, resident woodland species, is not actually really picked up very well by the timing of some of the monitoring. From April onwards, they're invisible. They go quiet, the leaves are on the trees. If you're lucky, you might find a nest in, in May, but normally you won't. Um, often in some parts of the country, they're in inaccessible areas. This isn't a challenge of mountains or anything, it's private land. Um, so Surrey is a classic example where a lot of the places is really difficult to get into and they are the sort of wet wooded landscape that lesser spots are likely to be in. And the final factor here is I think it's dropped off um, what I call the birders radar. Um, people go to a special place to get it on their year list and don't even think that it's a bird in their patch that they ought to be looking for. Um, I find this quite interesting. If you compare the winter distribution with the breeding distribution of the last atlas, the lesser spot was actually recorded in more squares in the winter distribution than in the breeding. And I think that reflects birds picked up by the um, time tetrad visits um, in late winter when they became active. By the time the uh, tetrad visits for the main atlas are being done, the lesser spots have gone quiet. Rare breeding bird panel produced guidance for lesser spot recording. Um, I had quite a hand in this, and it has all the usual criteria for possible breeding, probable breeding, proof breeding. Um, to my mind, um, most of that doesn't really matter too much. The main factor now is whether the birds are actually present in the area. Um, going the next step to proving breeding or whatever is really quite tough and quite specialised. Um, but in general, as a resident species, if they're around in the area, you can bet you're, they're trying to breed. And so you're not worried about migrants being misrecorded or anything like that. And the key thing for the whole uh, guidance is to get out early in the season. So in the guidance we talk about from uh, February through to June is a time to do any recording of lesser spots, including finding nests and things. I'd even actually say that uh, you could include January in that as well. So this year, for instance, there's been a lot of lesser spot activity through January because January was pretty warm. Um, so early season recording is the key message. Uh, Mark Eaton, when he took over for Mark Hollin as a uh, uh, secretary of the panel um, in one of his early reports has produced these trend graphs for lesser spotted woodpecker um, and it does look from the existing panel data that they've gone down by a few percent each year. Um, the data's not that good. Um, what I've done here on the right is actually extracted all the records each year and a few points to make about that. The first is that the rare breeding panel are picking up 300 territories each year 
um, compared with the BBS, which might be doing 10 or 20 if, if we're lucky. Um, so that's why I think rare breeding bird panel has a big role to play, um, that actually uh, a lot of lesser spots are being reported to the panel. Um, the other thing to note is that big um, spike at the beginning of the trend there, and then it dropped off to being flat thereafter. Uh, that was thought to be um, the result of um, field work for the National Atlas, meaning more birds recorded. It does raise the uh, question of recording effort and how you kind of standardize that in monitoring. Now, traditionally, Rare Breeding Bird Panel have published totals, total numbers for each of the species they're monitoring. And that's absolutely fine for, for the really rare species um, and for the species where there are uh, annual monitoring schemes in place, like, for instance, the bittern. Um, and the sort of rare birds of prey where you're pretty sure you've, you're getting all the numbers. But for species like lesser spot, there is no way you're ever going to count them all. So you have to come up with a method of uh, producing an index rather than just the numbers. So you could use the numbers as an index, but you know that's fraught with problems. And there's a new approach on the block which may help with this. It's called occupancy modelling. Um, now, for these statistical techniques, you can always buy great books on them. And if most people like me, you can read about the first six pages and then it becomes pretty incomprehensible. But there's well-developed methods now for modeling um, occurrence of species in uh, places or time or whatever. And this occupancy modeling is rather similar to the models that are used to model survival rates of coloring birds. And so what the system you have is multiple years, over multiple years, um, if this was colouring birds, it would be different individual birds, but for lesser spots, it could be the sites on which they occur. And you visit the sites, and in this year, lesser spots were found. That year, nobody got to the site. Lesser spots found all the way through here. 2028, in this example, um, none were found. None were found in 29, and then some were found in 30. And then you've got all different combinations. So I got doing this uh, slide, I got a bit bored with the combinations. But essentially what you can do with this method is to estimate not only the uh, presence of the lesser spots on the site, uh, but the probability that you would have detected them. And that's really important because they're so difficult to detect. You've got to allow for that. Um, we do need to do a little bit extra with um, rare breeding bird panel data. Uh, we need to think about getting lists of lesser spot sites in each county, and we need to devise a way for the recorders to say whether those sites were checked or not. But I don't think this is on onerous. I think um, you know, it's pretty uh, straightforward to pull that together. So that's my first idea for way forward. And it links quite nicely to the next one, and that's county surveys. Now, for a long time, I thought it was impossible to do county surveys of uh, lesser spots. Um, but actually in Hampshire last year, with Rob Clements again, Linda and I organised a county survey, which actually worked pretty well. And what we did is we selected one kilometre squares. Um, I think one kilometre squares is the appropriate scale for this um, kind of feasible areas to survey. And we had standard methods, three visits through um, March, early April. Um, over the whole county, and we selected nearly 200 one kilometre squares, 135 in the New Forest, 64 in the rest of Hampshire. We adopted the same survey methods in all of them, but we had different sampling strategies. So in the New Forest, we knew there were lots of birds, and so we scored the different squares for suitable habitat and surveyed those, and that was quite easy. For the rest of Hampshire, we did something which I think is more applicable to other counties, where we went through the bird records submitted to uh, the recorder, Keith Betton at the time, um, and selected squares that had had records of less spots over the last decade and, and sorted it out that way. Um, so I think that's a good way forward. Uh, what we found in Hampshire is we actually found 180 plus territories, which is amazing, 174 in the New Forest, only seven in the rest of Hampshire. So we fear there's probably a decline going on there. And the total county population came out at 300. 
um, which is amazing. That's about 15% of the British population. And we will be writing this up for the Hampshire Bird Report. And we're actually thinking of doing a paper in BB on it as well, because we think it has much wider applicability than, than just Hampshire. The other advantage of this doing this is it kind of sets the a baseline for future monitoring. So you can then go back to the occupancy monitoring using the sites you surveyed first time round and um, and really have a, a good monitoring scheme going forward. So that's my time up, I think. So thank you for listening. In summary, I think Rare Breeding Bird Panel has a key role to play in monitoring this species. And I hope we can develop that monitoring to be really much more useful in the future. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ken. And hopefully you'll join us um, on video in a moment to answer one or two questions. We've got a few coming in. We haven't got time to deal with them all. But as I said, we'll try and endeavour to see if we can get replies to ones that weren't answered. Um, specifically, a monitoring question here, Ken, from Alan Knox. Uh, would passive audio recording help detection of lesser spots, particularly software to, with software to scan the recordings? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, it's already worked on one Sussex site, on the RSPB site at Poolborough, and had passive um, recorders out for woodlarks and picked up lesser spot, uh, which is great. And there's a RSPB sabbatical project um, around in this here in Wales, where they're putting out passive recorders. Um, so we'll see what happens. But yeah, I think there's a, a good chance. And the, the drum of lesser spot is quite distinguishable. You can measure them from recordings and be absolutely sure. OK, thanks very much. Um, I have to ask you an ecological question, even though you're not actually covering that directly, but five people have, have voted for this. Um, is the influence of ash dieback on lesser spot of woodpeckers, could it have a similar impact to, to what apparently Dutch elm disease had? Um, I hope so. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of ash dying down here. Um, there's a lot of evidence of great spots feeding on it. Um, we're finding big infestations of bark beetles on these dying ash trees, so the food's there. Um, we've had um, lesser spots feeding on dead ash, so uh, maybe it is. I'm getting more optimistic as time goes on, but of course it'll only be a temporary thing because an awful lot of the ash is being removed and it it will be a pulse of food as the ash trees die. Great, thank you. And one very one final question here. Two questions actually rolled into one. It's about the northern end of their range. And um, one question from Humphrey asks about whether Scotland and the north of England could become climatically suitable for lesser spots. And another question uh, further on from Pete Clark suggests is asking, do you think they're actually there and are overlooked? North Yorkshire, Cumbria, Durham, et cetera, or is that fanciful? Uh, do that one first. I think that's fanciful. The, the Durham Bird Club have having a, been having a big effort to find them, and um, they're not finding them, so I think they're probably not there. Um, Humphrey's question. Um, I think uh, East Scotland could be quite suitable. So one of the issues we think is a food supply um, technological mismatch problem that they're having, and because the breeding success is low, they're not making enough lesser spotted woodpeckers to be able to colonise further north. There are big gaps in suitable habitat. So they could, I think, do okay in um, East Scotland if you could get them there. That must be similar to some of the Scandinavian situations they're in. I think in the West, it would probably be too wet. They certainly don't like you know, big periods of wet weather during the breeding season, so I think that would rule it out there. But that's something for the future. Thank you. Yes, and the notion of translocation has been raised. So who knows what might happen with that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. That was really interesting. And thanks for joining us. Uh, so we'll have to move on now to our penultimate talk. Um, so uh, just like to introduce now uh, Chantal McLeod Nolan. Um, Chantal's an RSPB project officer working on the Life on the Edge uh, project, a partnership project which aims at restoring coastal sites to benefit seabirds and waders. And her background focuses on species protection through EU funded projects, particularly the Life Plus Little Turn Recovery Project and the Roseate Turn Life Recovery Project. Chantal, welcome and thanks for talking to us. Hello, my name is Chantal McLeod Nolan. I'm here to talk to you about some life recovery projects. So um, I hope you enjoy. 
So why did we need a species recovery project for roseate terns and also little terns? Well, both of which are species of conservation concern. Uh, the roseate tern is red listed while the little tern is amber listed. And unfortunately, the situation as it is, uh, roseate terns have a very restrictive range. Historically, they um, they went through one of the most severe population declines. Um, they Back in the 19th century, they were actually persecuted for their plumage during the millinery trade. They've recovered somewhat, but unfortunately um, proceeded to decline again. Um, and in 1989, there were only 467 pairs left in the UK and Ireland. The population has recovered from that though. However, it is still very restricted with only three main breeding colonies and as a result, this project was focused on to trying to boost the population and help it expand. The Little Turn project, it, well, the Little Turn is, as I mentioned, amber listed. They also have very um, uh, niche habitat requirements, um, very short foraging range. And they, the, as they nest on sandy and shingle substrate on the beaches or in similar areas like that, they encounter quite a lot of disturbance from both human as well as predation, as well as habitat squeeze um, and increased competition for nesting space. So the projects came about uh, really important habitat, um, sorry, um, partnership projects. And as a result, they were funded, uh, part funded by the EU Life Grant, which was brilliant. So this is where the projects covered. Red was the direct areas of where they were able to do work um, with the funding. And then, of course, you've got the other aspects where we improved communications between uh, sites outside of the projects. Um, in this case, for example, sharing best practice on management. Um, and then, of course, we have an annual newsletter for both of these species, which we aim to keep this momentum going, even though the, the life projects have now ended. And we've also, with networking, we've established links with key partners in Europe. So that was very useful as well, because you can't think of little terns and roseate terns as just one colony. You've got to think of them as a meta population. So this is just to show you where the roseate terns nested and their figures last year. Um, the project focused on the three main colonies, of course. Um, you've also got the ones in orange, which is where we were hoping to improve the sites for future recolonization. And as you can see, the scaries and whales have had one or two breeding pairs of roseate terns, which was fantastic news. Um, with Larnlock um, holding the last remaining roseate term pair, by the way, in Northern Ireland. So we worked very hard um, during the project to restore the island, which had been flooding. And as a result, it benefited not just roseates, but also sandwich terns and black-headed gulls. Um, I won't go into this much, but I know that um, people will be aware of the AI situation. Obviously, it's um, been a problem for our roseates on Coquit. This is um, just showing you where the stronghold is. So Rockabill, of course, supports the largest proportion of the population, but um, it's been a really severe loss to hear about the, the fact that some of our roseate terns have died on coquette. So this year will be very um, interesting to find out the impact of that, but we are aware that we lost uh, a large proportion of the adults on coquette and the productivity was also its lowest since 1985. But I will say just um, to say that I've talked about the fact that we've got these two projects and I'll talk about a third one in a minute. This was only, uh, you know, thanks to our amazing team of staff and volunteers that really, you know, we were able to achieve some of the successes through these projects, you know, protecting these birds on the ground as well as uh, behind the desks, because, you know, it's it's a really tough job and it's a partnership project. So we were working across multiple organizations and um, and of course, you've got multiple sites to deal with with different issues. So just to put this in perspective, the Little Turn Life Project recruited more than 60 seasonal wardens and project officers during the five years, and they helped monitor and protect the terns nesting on the beaches. And then you've also got our amazing volunteers, and we had over 250 that did the vital work on these turn colonies, and they made such a difference because, of course, they helped with the habitat work, they helped with the monitoring, they helped with the people engagement. So yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out and say thank you. And they're still continuing to do this, by the way, because although the project's ended, you know, these, these you know, volunteers and staff are just continuing to protect these species. So protection. So on site, you've got um, 
situations where we were putting up fencing, some of it's rope fencing to try and deter public from walking on our little turn colonies and, and that's because they're very well camouflaged as you can see by this picture. Fen uh, fencing also included like um, electric fencing, both semi-permanent and permanent depending on the site conditions and that was to you know prevent mammalian predation and then of course you've got signage which um, helped inform the public on what we were doing and why. Other things we were doing was also trying to improve the conditions of the sites. So this is sand patches, for example, and also where sites were not as suitable due to flooding or other issues such as predation, we would try and use turns and lures to try and attract them to a slightly safer area. Um, for roseate terns, um, they like to nest in crevices. So nest boxes were introduced uh, quite a long time ago, and this has been a very effective way of protecting and uh, you know helping these uh, terns. So installing more of these and creating more of these terraces which is um, which has all these nest boxes has been one of the key things that have been done and also improving like the hides and um, that was useful for like monitoring and night shifts this one is now able to do 360 degree movement which is useful when the weather of course changes and also the fact that we're working with roseates but then you've got little terns and all the nesting species also in the vicinity of these different species so for common terns we were creating uh, you know more of these shelters which protect uh, their chicks from avian predation so there's less competition for the common terns to try and use the nest boxes because their chicks might try and use them for shelter as well so um predation i just mentioned a couple of examples of uh, fencing so we've also got other things so we've got night uh, wardens we've got um bait to try and you know protect islands so this is where really useful to have a biosecurity plan then also you've got things like um, an agri laser which was a two-year laser hazing study to see if we could try and deter uh, gulls and crows and these are like uh, you know really useful for monitoring and trying to we knew we try and do non-lethal measures uh, you know because of course we're all trying to they're all trying to survive and we Ooh, sorry move that too quickly but yeah um yeah, so we basically we're trying to use non-lethal methods to protect the colonies. Um, moving on quickly, just to say that we have, um, during the Rosie Term project, we wanted to get a better understanding of the movements um, and what was really, you know, fueling the populations on the respective islands. And this paper, you know, used data from ringing and reciting from these three colonies. And as a result, we got a very good demo demography paper, giving us a, a really good understanding of the population growth rate for each colony. So as you can see here, it's what's really important, of course, is immigration for some of the sites such as Coquit and uh, Ladies Island Lake, whereas Rockerville, it's really adult survival and productivity. Um, so just to say, um, in recent years, because the um, survival of um, uh, you know uh, juveniles from uh, you know that were born on coca, um, basically there had been more and more uh, coca born birds breeding on coca. The actual proportion had changed slightly, so it was becoming more self-sustaining because because immigration is very important. But it showed in previous years that the population was uh, becoming uh, more self-sustaining, which would be very good for coca should anything happen to the other sites, obviously. Um, we will have to take into account the effects of AI, but that's something we won't know until, again, in the next couple of years. This is the paper. I'm afraid I can't, um, it's a whistle stop tour, but this is, um, this is if you're interested in learning more about the metapopulation dynamics, I suggest you check it out, very interesting. Um, and yeah, going to roseate terms, just to say one of the things, of course, was focusing on where we would work for recolonization. So we looked at the, you know, the priority areas and the boxes identify where it would be for focusing our efforts to improve the common turn colonies, which, of course, roseate terns nest among. And then, of course, having a better understanding of their foraging and, and of course, their key uh, food sources. So these are the areas that were highlighted at the end of the Rosier Term project. So I mentioned networking, and this is just to give you some examples, because of course, as I said, they don't understand borders. So in some areas, it's really useful we work, but we need to keep the communication between um, colonies, because um, obviously people are coming up with new solutions, and um, you can see here this at the bottom picture in France, they were installing nest boxes to see if that would improve their uh, roseate turn population. And generally just sharing ideas is, is really useful. 
So this is just a, a, an example of um, a, a map. So the source is Sustainable Shores, which focused on surveying um, the habitat loss. Um, and basically it was an assessment where they also identified you know, through mapping opportunities. But this just gives you an idea of why it's so important that we look into restoring parts of the coastline um, for some of our turn species. Which brings me on to the Third Life project, which is a four-year project. It's halfway through and it's, it's, it's focused on restoring key sites in and in basically improving their long-term resilience um, with regards to climate change. So the project species are not just terns, it's also other species such as breeding waders like ring plover, oyster catcher, red shank, but also wintering species which will be using the same habitats. And uh, basically it's, it's, it's a, a very much focused on um, improving the, these sites and then tackling the issues such as disturbance as well. So it all ties in uh, well with the previous project. So this is the project sites. They are um, Again, um, based in England, these ones, um, we're working with lots of different partners. So some of them are like Harwich Haven Authority. Um, you've got Cumber Wildlife Trust, Na uh, Natural England, National Trust, BirdAware Solent, uh, Environment Agency. And this has been really useful because, as I mentioned, it's habitat based. So in this case, in Hodbarrow in Cumbria, we were looking at uh, the creation of a 0.5 uh, hectare new island, which as you can see on the left, and then extending the existing one, which is over by the right, and then putting in uh, fencing to protect it from mammalian predation. So um, to say that, yes, the uh, extension was successful. Um, we had um, terns and using, common terns using it in, in, the, in the first year, one or two, and then last year, apparently more of them were using them and it was a good number, so fantastic sign for creating more nesting space. Uh, another example is Titchwell Marsh. Um, so Titchwell uh, focuses on um, not just the coast, this project, but also on like freshwater habitats, which will benefit, you know, a range of breeding and wintering species. Um, so this basically focused on creating um, 12 islands in, um, for, for birds to use, but also, you know, um, improving the condition of the freshwater marsh and reed bed, so uh, water control structures and reed removal. So it's a, it's a really um, good uh, sign for multiple species because um, after doing this work, they had one of the best years in 10 years with bitterns nesting area apparently in pools in that they had extend in in the pool that they had extended, the uh, the reed bed held uh, great white uh, egrets, grey herons, and then avocets had a peak count of 97 pairs with lots of chick visible and three common terns, uh, sorry three pairs of common terns, um, which is the first time in 10 years. So it just shows how important it is to kind of make these sites and uh, keep them fresh and dynamic. Um, Uh, another uh, example was our recharge project. It was a flagship one in Horsey. It's uh, using dredge material to restore an eroding shingle bank. And that's it's a very important site for uh, little terns in Essex because it's uh, their host their main site. It's their main site for little terns. And it will also provide more protection for the grazing marsh, which is very important for breeding waders. Um, so as you can see here, this is the work being done to, to bring the, the dredge material along onto the uh, shingle bank area. And this is a map, um, yeah, sorry, this is an, um, a, uh, this shows you the what it was beforehand and then once the deposit, once the substrate had been deposited. Um, and yeah, so the uh, great news, uh, last year we had little terns making use of the new habitat with 14 nests on the new shingle area and a further eight nests on the existing bank. So fantastic sign. Um, just to say, we're also working on beach nesting birds programs. So we're working with local communities um, and visitors in Cumbria and the Solent, you know, to raise and uh, raise awareness and protect beaching, beach nesting birds. So yeah, it's a, a really uh, exciting project. And of course, we're working and linking in with other beach nesting birds programs and mitigation schemes. So um, this involves 
involves linking in with like what we've done before with the previous projects, such as uh, in pr producing interpretation materials, uh, best practice examples as well. And we've done also webinars, for example, to again to share uh, knowledge between organisations and countries which have uh, you know, the similar species that we're trying to protect. And of course, our long term strategy is that we'll continue to work with these statutory agencies and other NGOs. And basically, we'll identify where we'd like to work next. Of course, what future flagship beneficial use of dredged material projects we can uh, find, of course. And then with the legacy is basically uh, where we would you know, like to work in the future. And yeah, I would just like to say thank you. Um, that was a very short uh, you know, overview of the project. Uh, so I'm sure there were things that I wasn't able to mention, but um, hopefully that was enough to pike, uh, pike your interest. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to find out more, feel free to contact us. Um, Life in the Edge is running for another two years and we are still continuing with the legacy work of the Little Turn and the Rosie Turn project, even though the, the actual projects have ended. And as I said, this was a partnership. This is a partnership, you know, not just not just me. And so I'd like to say, again say thank you to everyone, and of course the Life uh, Program for their funding. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much indeed, Chantal. Um, we are running slightly behind schedule, but there's time for questions if people would like to pop them in. There was one particular issue which you touched on, which I th we haven't mentioned much during today's or yet today or yesterday. And that's the impact of um, avian influenza uh, on roseate terns. It's obviously something that's hit roseate tern, one of the panel species. We don't have so many other panel species where we have particular evidence that HPAI has had a massive impact. I was wondering whether your project, which is ongoing and halfway through, has the flexibility to be able to change its objectives and respond to any mortality that, for example, came last year, might come this year, and therefore requires some other measures to be taken to boost their chances of survival. Um, unfortunately, um, so um, unfortunately, just to say, with Life on the Edge, we're not covered in the same SBAs as we were with the Roseate Turn Life project. So although the projects have links together, um, we actually don't have any sort of um, like funding that can directly go to COCA. Um, and to be honest, right now, we're still trying to understand the impact of what's happened to the roseate terns. And, and especially we were, so the little terns were so far unscathed. So it will be very interesting to see what happens this year, because obviously we'll do our best, but we can't control the birds. And so if they do contract a strain of avian influenza, we'll just have to see how severe that affects the population. And we are just hoping it doesn't affect, um, as I mentioned, uh, roseate tern, the stronghold of roseate terns is rockabill. So although we, we're very, you know, we were very upset to hear about what happened on Coca, if we lose the stronghold, that will make it even long, make it even harder for the population to recover. Yeah, sure, understood. Um, there's a comment from Murray Orchard about that island restoration in the Medway is definitely needed. I think that's probably something you can note from the uh, the chat there. Um, but a question about the lifespan of the dredged material islands in Essex uh, and how are they managed? So um, they're not added to annually. This is actually um, so one of our. Uh, flagship projects in Life on the Edge is basically this is a way of showing that you can because because dredge material is periodically done for channel deepening projects uh, a lot of the material just gets deposited off the coast and not actually used in the UK whereas in other countries like the Netherlands they use that material to rebuild part of their coastline so for us Life on the Edge we were this was done in conjunction with Howard Shaven Authority by the way an uh, environment agency um, and we were able to do this um, uh, dredged project but unfortunately it's something that can only probably be done with more funding in the future so right now this is as far as we can go with the life on the edge project and hopefully if we can find more funding avenues in the future we can a, get a better understanding how long it takes for the, the new dredged material to to um basically how long it will last there it could erode again with wave action that's something we will only be able to tell with continued monitoring Thank you very much. And we'll take one last question, which is a the perennial and difficult issue of dogs on beaches. Um, are there control measures that you've taken that which which, which work? So, I mean, this is this is something that all of the projects have really worked hard on. And again, goes back to where we have an amazing group of uh, volunteers and wardens on site. They, we have produced signage saying, please keep your dogs on the lead for a period of 
where the terns are nesting, or even ring plovers and oyster catchers, which also use the same sort of habitat. Um, and to some scale, people will read them because, but again, it will depend on the individuals who are reading the signs. So we really find having fencing, um, signage, and but also having people on the ground make a difference. And we're looking into having a better understanding of how we can get our message across to the public um, through the Life on the Edge and the Beach Nesting Birds programmes. Thank you very much. That's um, a good answer and a very comprehensive presentation, which obviously contains an enormous amount of work by a lot of people. So thank you very much indeed for joining us and telling us about that. OK, we move on to the final presentation of the evening now. Um, this is by Mark Holling. Um, Mark, of course, is well known to probably everybody here, uh, but he's been a birder since primary school and he has a long, long lasting interest in the status and, and um, um, populations of breeding birds. He was, of course, Rare Breeding Bird Panel Secretary from 2006 to 2020. And since retiring for that, he's taken on a role as essentially the archivist for the panel, looking to fill data gaps and open up the archive through uh, analysis and published papers, which he's had a few underway already. I'm sure Mark's talk will contain a great deal of interest. So, Mark, it's over to you. Good evening, everyone. The rarest of the rare. The RBPP archive, dating back to 1973, includes a treasure trove of fascinating records, some widely known like the first and so far only confirmed breeding record of Purple Heron, Kent, 2010. Others are other occurrences which were shrouded in, mis in secrecy at the time. As panel archivist, I'd like to dig into that treasure chest and share with you today some of the rarest of the rare. First, some perspective. About 210 native species nest in the UK regularly. Since 1973, we have reported on a total of 180 native species in our annual reports published in British Birds. Of these, 78 are annual breeders. These are the most important from a conservation point of view. Species like Black Red Start, Common Potchard, Little Ring Plover and Osprey shown here. But that leaves about 100, which are less frequently reported to us. Some have never bred, some have only bred on a few occasions. It is these, arguably the rarest of the rare, that attract the greatest interest among birders, and which are the focus of this talk. In 1947, Arthur Ransom published the classic Great Northern, which described finding breeding Great Northern divers. I read this book as a teenager. Perhaps it sparked my lifelong interest in breeding birds and especially the unusual ones. It is reported that a pair of Great Northern Divers did actually breed in 1970 before the RBBP was founded, but there has been no confirmed breeding by the species since, although we have reported at least seven instances of mixed pairing with black-throated divers, most recently in 2017. However, Although originally published as a pure pair, it seems likely that the 1970 record might actually have involved a mixed pair and the presence of a hybrid bird paired with an adult Great Northern Diver at the site the following year might support that view. Nowadays, the RBBP ensures there is no doubt over such significant records. So we await the first definitive breeding by the species. Perhaps here is an opportunity for one of you to make history. The pie chart shows how we classify the breeding status of rare breeding birds. The rarer bird breeders could fall into any of the four categories pointed out here. Over half of the species classed as rare breeders have only nested, occasionally have never been proved to breed at all, or are new colonisers like cattle egret. After cattle egrets first bred in 2008, there was a lull in records, but in recent years numbers have ramped up with 35 pairs at 11 sites in 2020. A few species, like Rhineck and Golden Oriole, were once regular breeders, but they have, they have not bred for over 10 years, so are now classed as former breeders. This photo shows a male Rhineck that held territory in Hampshire in 2018 and cleared out this nest hole in hope and anticipation, but it remained unpaired. Most records of Rhinecks in breeding habitat from the last 30 years have been singing birds in the forests in the Scottish Highlands. Yet when the RBBP was formed in the 1970s, up to 20 pairs of Rhinex bred, mainly in southern England. After a long period of reliable annual breeding, Golden Oriole was last proved to breed in 2009 in Suffolk. 
Another example is Serin, not shown here, which has not been confirmed breeding since 2006. A paper on breeding Serins in the UK is in preparation, due to be published in British Birds in the summer. And Kentish Plover, also formerly an annual breeder, has not bred for even longer, the last being in 1979. Whilst these species may feasibly nest again, they are certainly among the rarest of the rare now. In the 1970s, two Arctic species nested on the high tops of the Scottish mountains, but since then have occurred only occasionally. Shorelarks spread in 1975 to 77, and there were pairs in several years in the early 2000s, plus a pair in June 2020 in Shetland. Lapland bunting spread in 77 to 80, with singles in five of the six years, 2011 to 16. But there has been nothing since. In contrast, purple sandpipers, which first bred at about the time, same time in the line, late 1970s, continue to hang on in these remote areas. Some formerly regular breeders like Redback Shrike and Fieldfare now nest only sporadically, while others like Montague's Harrier have very low populations. Such species may soon be classed as former breeders. Since 1976, Montague's Harriers have nested annually, but numbers have been declining and there was no confirmed breeding in 2020, as shown here by this graph of numbers breeding between 1973 and 2020. Some species are so rare that they have only bred as part of a mixed pair. Of the 13 species reported as mixed pairs, four are ducks, three are raptors and three are larids, gulls and terns. Many are North American species, including three of these shown here. The first black kite is a European species. We have one record in 2006, following summering over several years, one bred with a red kite in Highland with two hybrid young fledged. Ring-billed gull, one bird has occurred in most years in Perth and Kinross since 2009, pairing with a common gull. Although eggs have been laid, no chicks have ever been seen. Northern Harrier, one record in two, 2016, a male bred with a female hen harrier in Orkney. Nest with eggs recorded, but breeding failed after they hatched. Kildare, one bird formed a mixed pair with a ringed plover in Shetland in 2007. The pair were seen distraction displaying, but in this instance, breeding was not confirmed. Even this type of record is valuable and of interest to the RBBP. Kildare are one of only two wholly near Arctic species where breeding has been confirmed in the Western Palearctic. More of the second later. About a quarter of the species on the RBBP list have never bred in the UK. A few, most notably Great Reed Warbler, occur in most years, but all are singing males. There has never been a known instance of a pair, but for two consecutive years in the 1990s, nest building was observed at the same site in Kent. Our database shows that birds singing for at least five days have been recorded in 33 out of the 48 years, with a maximum of five males in 2019. Over 20 species have only appeared in an RBBP report as a single bird in breeding habitat, exhibiting breeding behaviour, but not part of an established pair. These four examples have done so, to our knowledge, only once. Buff-breasted sandpiper, in 2008, a single male was reported displaying over a three-day period in early June at a site in Cambridgeshire. Pallid Swift. In 2009, one bird was present for an extended period from late April to late May, associating with common swifts and often seen over established common swift breeding air sites. Sardinian Warbler. In 2015, a singing male held territory in Cornwall. And then Short-toed Lark. In 2014, a singing male held territory from mid-May into June in the surprising location of the Outer Hebrides. Another example where we have had only one breeding season record of a single bird in breeding habitat is the Great Snipe, which displayed in suitable nesting habitat at Cly in Norfolk in 2011. Most still are singing males like the Western Benelli's Warbler in Derbyshire in 2011, the singing booted warbler at Spurn in 1992, and the three spectacled warblers in 92, 99 and 2014, the latter famously built a nest at Burnham over in Norfolk. More promising are the pairs which have teamed up and held territory or displayed, 
but the breeding attempt progressed no further, as far as we know. Examples are sandling on mountain tops in the Highlands in 1973 and 1974, and turnstone on offshore islands in 1975, 76, and 1992. We also have records of pectoral sandpiper, including displaying pairs at two sites in Scotland in, 2014, in 2004. You can find more details of these and other examples in our Explore Reports facility on our website. All but the most recent of our published reports from British birds are accessible by species, species and year. I recommend you look at Broadbill Sandpiper in 1990-1983. The blue throat is an example of a species which has bred on more than one occasion, but breeding is still very unusual. Blue throats are particularly interesting as there are two races distinctive in spring. The nearest breeding areas of the white spotted race are in the Netherlands, while red spotted blue throats nest in Scandinavia. Records of breeding white spotted blue throats in the UK tend to be in lowland, mainly marsh habitats, and all have been in England. For, it, for instance, in 2010 to 11, a male held territory at Welney in Norfolk, and a male at a site in the Cambridge Fens in 2011 returned in 2012. The only record of confirmed breeding by the white spotted race was on Thorn Moors, South Yorkshire, in 1996, documented here, when amazingly there were two pairs. Red spotted blue throats have bred four times in Highland, with the first in 1968 predating the formation of the RBBP. In 1985, birds were at three sites in northern Scotland, and one pair was proved to breed, another bred in 1995. These were in wooded, damp areas, but the most recent record in 2016 was in treeless, montane habitat. Here are the images of the 2016 breeding attempt which proved to be successful, one young fledged, thanks to the diligent and patient follow-up visits by the finder. A few species have only bred on one occasion. One spotted sandpiper, that's the other near Arctic species, bred on sky way back in 1975. The record was published at the time by the finder, but we, the panel, recently published further previously unpublished information in British birds are from the RB, RBBP archive series. The left hand image shows the bird at the site taken at the time. The site was closely monitored and following heavy rain, the nest was deserted. Subsequently, the clutch was collected under license and deposited with the National Museum of Scotland. Two of the eggs were opened, hence the damage, and found to contain partially developed embryos. Although there has been no further recurrence, we have seven further records of spotted sandpipers in breeding territory, but all have been single birds or individuals paired with common sandpipers. Another species that has been proved to breed on only one occasion is the long-tailed skewer. Although there have been single birds summering in Shetland in recent years, amazingly a pair bred in 1980 along the Angus coast in eastern Scotland. Other examples of species which have been proved to breed only once are redneck grebe, night heron and Iberian chiffchaff. All of these species have been recorded in other years as single birds on territory or as part of a mixed pair, but these are the strong candidates to be our rarest breeders. So, what of the future? Now with 10 records of spring males holding, ter holding territory, all since 2000, Perhaps the next species to be added to our list of breeding birds in the UK will be the Blythe Three Warbler. This one is an autumn bird at Farrell Bird Observatory. We have records of territorial birds in spring from eight recording areas, mainly in Scotland, but also in Cumbria and Lincolnshire. And another prediction. Currently, we have no records on the RBBP database for this species, but surely one year in a northern coniferous forest someone will find a red flank blue tail. Occurring widely in the Russian taiga, in the last 30 years it has expanded into Finland as shown by fieldwork for the two European bird atlases. It's coming up to... The population in Finland varied from 150 to a phenomenal 6,500 pairs. With other eastern vagrants like yellow-browed and palaces warblers overwintering in spring in Britain and being recorded singing in spring, maybe there is a chance. I'll leave you on that optimistic note, and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have.
Great, thank you very much indeed. That's brilliant, Mark. Um, I hope you, you are with us. I know you're you're perhaps in a far distant land, but uh, we will have a um, brief period for anyone to post any questions at the end. But thank you very much indeed. That was great. Um, there aren't any actual questions in right now, but I, I just wanted to ask you directly whether you, you felt that out there, there are still archives and information that people are holding that they've not passed through to anyone, including the panel, and whether we've got any chance of finding them? I'm sure, I'm sure there are. Um, they, back in the 1970s and even the 1980s, when the panel was first formed, we, um, uh, we know that there were hints and rumours of records of birds nesting in obscure places that didn't reach the panel. There was a great level of secrecy at that time. And I'm sure there are data out there. And I would certainly plead to anybody listening who knows um, and has got um, definite information about such records to send them to the secretary so that we can add them into the archive and fo follow these things through. Thanks very much. Um, there's one or two messages just coming in saying thanks to us all for speaking, but uh, at the moment there's no further questions coming in. Um, <laughs> so I think you must have catalogued everything so adequately that uh, everyone is uh, stunned into silence. Um, well, that's, that, but, uh, that's fine by me. I, it was interesting, uh, Dawn's just commented there, but um, Dawn was asked, asked at the beginning of the evening what her predictions were, and I can confirm that she hadn't seen my talk, but she will, she will now have seen I've made exactly the same two predictions for the, for, for future editions. There, there is a, a question that's just appeared. You, you can see it, I'm sure. Um, supposed rest, uh, record of breeding crested lark in the 60s and 70s. Is it an urban myth, Sandwich Bay? I don't know about that. So uh, possibly it is an urban myth. Uh, crested lark, uh, as most people watching will know, is widespread in most parts of France and the near continent um, as a common breeder. Um, but there were no breeding records or even hints of um, summering that I'm aware of in Britain. Um, it's possible that someday one may, may occur um, and maybe something has happened in the past. But if anybody has any definitive uh, information on that record, please please submit it and we'll try and follow that through and check with the county recorders and if it can be added to our archive, that would be great. A yeah, really important point that these kinds of speculations and info information points should come through and we can follow them up. But on a slightly perhaps a, a point that you can respond more positively to, a question about whether Temming stints have disappeared off the map in the last 20 years. Uh, they had disappeared off, off the map, but uh, there have been hints of uh, recent uh, recurrences. Um, Mark's processing data on, on um, recent years, and it looks like possibly there has been some summary records there that, that we'll be reporting on later in, in the year. But that's a species that um, bred at very low levels in Scotland uh, for a number of years and then became much less frequent and may, um, may have continued to breed or because people weren't checking in the right areas, there's, there's many suitable habitats in Scotland where the bird could breed and uh, could therefore go unnoticed. But um, it's the kind of bird that may come and go, we're right on the edge of potential range of, of that species. You can probably see that the question has appeared as to whether black woodpecker will ever get here. Is that a prediction from you? <laughs> no, that's not, that's not a prediction. Um, uh, woodpeckers are not very good at uh, traveling large distances and they certainly don't like going over water. I think it's very unlikely that black woodpecker will occur. Uh, one, one of the things that's a problem with predictions is that, that we have to look at the continental populations and some of these species are declining and the ranges are reducing, often more to Eastern Europe and away from Western Europe, which reduces the opportunities for those species ever coming, ever coming here, despite climate changes and possible um, suitable habitats opening up in, the British, in Britain. Great, and I think the final comment I shall take is possibly not a question from Tim Sharrock suggesting that um, Rumours from the 70s included Craig Martin and Middle Spotted Woodpecker. Well, he won't reveal the localities, so we can't do anything more with that, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Yes, well, I'd love, love, 
love to hear some of that information. It's again, with the middle spot woodpecker seems unlikely. Craig Martin is is a possibility, but um, it's quite a long way from where they currently breed. But summering birds can, of course, occur. And I think sometimes these rumours are based on birds that were around for perhaps a week or two. Um, Twitch has followed them up. They may have, uh, may or may not have been reported through the Rarities Network. And then people sort of talk about, oh, they must have been breeding there. But actually, they, there was no indication of any, any breeding. I think that's where some of the rumours come from. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. I think we'll um, we'll call it a day there. So thanks for the thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. Thank and you. Thanks for the questions that have come in. So we will move to finish the meeting now. Um, it's been a really great evening. I think that all of us have learned a lot, uh, and I'd very much like to, to thank all the speakers who put in a lot of effort to give their presentations both today and and yesterday. So today we've had Dawn, Amy, Ian, Ken, Chantal, and Mark, and yesterday we had Mark, Eaton, uh, Marcus, Molly, Sarah, and Ali. Mark and Murray and Brian. So um, it was a great set and very, very varied and lots of interesting information there. Um, there is a reminder, of course, and Mark's just, Mark Eaton has just posted that in the chat, that um, the, the talks from yesterday and today are already on the RPPP's YouTube channel. So you can look at the talks uh, at your leisure afterwards or recommend them to other people, and that's great. And this is a reminder also that this is the start, the start of RPPP's birthday celebrations. There are several articles to appear this year and there will be some further web developments. So do look out for those. Um, they'll be notified, I'm sure, and everybody will hear about them. I'd like to thank Mark Eaton for putting a vast amount of effort into actually organizing this conference. It really was a, a lot of work and he's been coordinating things behind the scenes while we've all been listening today admirably. So that's great. And once again, I'd like very much to thank our funding bodies. Um, that's JNCC for the country agencies RSPB, BTO, and also for, to BB for being very cooperative in hosting our, our reports and other outputs. And it's really important too to thank um, everyone who supports the work of our BBP. I think it's come out very clearly from the presentations that, we, that there's no way that this archive, this incredibly valuable archive, could have been created without the input from bird watchers, thousands of bird watchers, uh, county bird recorders and a whole load of other organizations and people supplying information and coordinating it and passing it through. It's an immense effort. And as a result of that, we've got a system that is world leading. If not, it is unique, really. We've got a fantastic system that's going from strength to strength. So thanks to everyone for attending. We've had a good attendance over the last couple of days. Hope you've enjoyed it. And a final reminder, as Dawn and others have stressed, please send in your rare breeding bird records this coming breeding season uh, using bird track or through your local recorder or recording scheme. Um, go out and look. There's still stuff to be found. So I'd like to wish everyone a very good evening and just say goodbye to all. Thanks very much. <laughs>